Okay, so we're going to run Node-RED using uh, Docker Desktop for the people who don't have the NVM tool set, the Node, and all the stuff that is needed for Node-RED. And this is actually a really good example to show you that the value of Docker. Docker allows you to spin up software really, really quickly without having to install all the prerequisites for the software. So in case of Node-RED, why is it called Node-RED? Where is the Node word coming from? It's coming from Node.js because it is built on top of Node.js. And Node.js is an ecosystem that requires version management. So the proper way to install Node is using a Node version manager. So as you can see, it gets unwindy. NVM, no different versions, and you have no dread installed. But can you skip all of that? Yes, you can. The way Docker works is that it pulls images or applications, we call them containerized applications or containers, from a website called Docker Hub. The URL for Docker Hub is hub.docker.com. Unfortunately, you can't pull images from Docker Hub without having a Docker Hub account. But it is free and it's very easy to make and Node-RED have an official image. Official images will usually um, have the um, official image. Oh no, it doesn't have an official image. It's Node-RED backslash Node minus RED. So this is the image. Now in order to run Node-RED, we will need a longer command. Why? If you just, um, if you just, this is the pull line, but let's let's uh, talk about what we need to do to run Node-RED. So do you guys remember what is the command to run a Docker container? Uh, yes, Docker run. And what are the options needed? Every container will likely need a place to store its data. So that's the volume. And will also need to publish a port. In the case of the Node-RED container, it's called Node-RED backslash Node minus RED. If I run it like that, it will run, but it will be completely isolated from me and will have its data stored in a random location that will be lost when the, when the container gets destroyed. Now, the fact that the data will be destroyed is not important because this is just a demonstration but I still need to expose the port. If I don't expose the port, I'll not be able to open the website. So how do we expose a port on a, on a container? The, the option is minus P port, and you need to specify the port you're gonna access on your computer versus the port inside the container. The Docker, the, the Node-RED image will always expose 1880 on the inside, and on the outside, I'm going to link it to 1885 because I have a native Node-RED running on my computer. Right now, I'm running the Node-RED command using the NVM and the Node native installations on my computer. And my Node-RED is running at port 1880. So I cannot run this Docker container at the same port. And this is the advantage of running things with Docker because the program could be hardwired to a certain port, but you can connect it to any other port on the inside. It could also store its data on the inside somewhere, but you could decide any, any folder on your computer where you want to store the data. So I'm going to press enter. Now just remember, if you run it this way, this container will lose its data once it's closed. So um, you need to use the, the volume. So if you go to Docker Hub, and if you go to the Node-RED image, then you'll, have the, you'll find the correct command. So the correct command will save the data. So this is the full command. And if you're not aware of the P option and the V option, then you'll need to do some research on the Docker run command. You can also go to the simplified man page of the Docker run command. I really can't teach everything. So there's a lot of things that you need to explore on your own. So the first step is that we need to pull the image. And that's gonna take ages. Anyway, once it runs, you'll be able to run Docker Hub at localhost colon 1885 and the website will open. Right now I have it installed locally and this is Node-RED. Uh, this here is Node-RED. This is the last, the last program, the visual program that we made. I'm gonna delete it and I'm gonna just tell you some of the very, very basics about Node-RED and visual programming. So 
The first concept is that data comes to your visual program using an input node. Do you guys remember what an input node is? How to tell what an input node is? Yeah, the socket, it has a socket on the right side or it has like an outlet. It doesn't have a place on the left side where you can attach it to anything, only a place on the right side. The simplest and the most primitive input node in Node-RED is the inject node. The inject node introduces fixed data. Data that is not coming from the outside, but rather data that you dictate yourself. The simplest output node is the debug node, which again, doesn't take the data to the outside world, it just takes it and displays it in a side pane called the debug pane. If you connect these two nodes together, you create what we traditionally call the hello world program in classical programming. In classical programming, if you build a program that just shows a fixed sentence, that is considered the entry point to learning any new programming language or environment, that's the hello world program. Now, by just putting an inject node, which is the simplest input node, with the debug node, which is the simplest output node, and connecting them together, you have created an equivalent of a hello world program. If you deploy that, then you will be able to run this program by clicking the handle next to the inject node. Now, it is a hello world program in the sense that it's super simple and it just shows a fixed entity or fixed value, but it's not yet a hello world program in the sense that it shows you hello world. So if for everybody who has their Node-RED spinned up already, I would like to explore together how we can change the inject node to actually inject the sentence hello world. How we can change this very simplistic program from injecting what looks like to be a very long number to an actual sentence that says hello world. Because this is what a program, a hello world program is supposed to do. It's supposed to show hello world. You can just change the style. Okay, let's try to do that. What do, you, what do I do? Tell me, give me instructions. Double click the timestamp. I double click the timestamp. Change it to string. Whoa, nice. And then? Hello world, that's nice. So, it seems that the inject node is able to let you configure the message that it sends out. So this leads us to the very first concept in visual programming. In Node-RED and visual programming, information flows through those wires that connect nodes together, and the things that flow through those wires are called messages. Those messages have two parts. And I will let you discover on your own the two parts that these messages have by double clicking on the debug node. And I, what I want to do, I want to debug not only the message dot payload, which is the payload part of the message. I want to debug the entire message object. Yeah, we want the debug node to tell us everything that it sees, the entire thing. And let's have a follow-up discussion about that. So change that, deploy, do the thing again, and tell me what difference. Okay, some people uh, clicked a little bit too much and they ended up in the situation where they disabled the debug node. So you see here, those handles, this over here, and this over here, these are very special. These are only provided with the inject and the debug node. And what they do is that this one allows you to trigger the de inject node. And this here allows you to disable and enable the debug node. So if you ended up in, a, in this kind of place where this one is disabled, then no matter how many times you inject it, you'll not see anything in the right. So does everybody at this stage can see the hello world and the full object? The payload alone and the full object. Can you raise your hand if you get to this point? Beautiful. Now, what's the follow-up discussion? What, what, do, what do you guys think? What's the difference? Were you able to unfold the object? You can interact with those values on the right side. 
So what you see here is that the full object, the full entity that flows on those wires in visual programming does not only contain a payload, which was what we were seeing earlier. It also contains an underscore MSG ID, message ID, which is an internal identifier for that message, which we never use. It's just used internally by Node-RED, but there's also a topic. So the same like with a real message in the real world, where you have something, a title for the message, a subject for the email, and a body for the email, those entities or objects that flow along the wires in visual programming also has a payload and also has a topic. Now the question is, what, how is this payload and topic utilized? What do they mean? And the answer to that question is that it really depends on the node that is consuming the message object. So the question is, how do we learn more about what does nodes expect and how they will process the information that you give them. And the answer to that is that by using the nodes documentation. So here, for example, I have a Redis out node, which is not a standard node. It's a node that I install. This node will take the message object and will store it in a Redis database. And that Redis database can be spinned up in a moment of seconds using Docker Desktop, just the same way you spin Node-RED so quickly, you can also spin Redis so quickly by using the official Redis image. And if you updated your Docker Desktop, it's likely that you also have a home tab in your Docker Desktop where you have the Redis as one of the top, most commonly used Docker images. You can click the Run uh, button in the interface and you'll be able to spin a local Redis server just like that, so quickly. Now, in order to spin up um, a server, um, see here, when you click that button, the run, you will be able to register. Okay, that happened a little bit too quickly. Anyway, I'm gonna stop it. So don't worry about that. We're gonna talk about that later, but let's get back to uh, Node-RED. So if I want to know what the, the Redis out node is an output node, like the debug node, because it has an inlet or it has a socket at the left side. It takes information from your flow, but unlike the debug node, it does not only take it and display it internally, it takes it and actually makes use of it in the outside world. In the case of the Redis out <coughs> node, it could connect to a Redis database in the cloud or a Redis database on your computer and store information in it. So it's a really good example of an output node. Now, in order to know what kind of information it expects on this wire, the best way is to look up its manual. If you click on any node, and then you go to the help tab on the right pane, you'll see a manual that has been written for this node. Redis out acts as publisher using R push, L push, or publish. The message topic is the key name to publish. So it's telling you that it expects a topic as well as a payload. The topic is the key name and the, and the payload is the value. And if you're wondering what that means, on YouTube, there's a really nice video that I like from a YouTuber that I like. His name is Fireship.io, and his slogan is 100 seconds. So he basically makes, um, makes, makes videos that act like um, um, executive summaries for people who are maybe technical or maybe not technical, but it's more like it's 100 second, very quick presentation um, of something. So if you have, for example, Redis in 100 seconds, but like, let's say at the, at the database paradigms in 100 seconds. So there are a lot of different types of databases. So in this kind of database, like Redis, you just assign a key to a volume. So the key could be, for example, user one, user two, user three, and the volume could be the full name of the user or anything like that. It's just very, very simple. And this is what Redis does, and it's a memory inter, it's a memory database. 
And that brings us to the wide column database. Popular options in this family include Cassandra and HBase. A white column. Cassandra, on the other hand, it takes a key value, but instead of assigning a key value to a single value, you have a number of value. So you could have user one instead of just John, you could have John, 25 years old, and blue eyes. So you could have a number of value. It's still a very simplistic database, though. Options, Options in the document, the document family include MongoDB, Firestore, Firestore DynamoDB, Dynamo CouchDB, Couch and Dynamo MongoDB, DynamoDB, and also maybe in this category is Elasticsearch, a different kind of database. Have you heard of JSON? You know what JSON is? So some of your REST APIs, the REST APIs you're dealing with will give you a result that looks like text, but we call it JSON. A JSON is a textual representation of an object. So for example, the message object that we're dealing with right here can also be converted to JSON. Let me show you how to do that. It's very, very easy. Something else. I'm going to show you another example. Let's try to inject an object. So the same way we change the payload from a timestamp to a text, we can also go here in this dropdown and we choose JSON. Choose JSON is a way to create a structure. And we go to those three dots on the right side, and we go to the visual editor. So I have to delete everything in the edit JSON and go to the visual editor. And now I can create my own object. So let's, let's, for example, create an object that corresponds to a student. So a student has his name. So let's say my name is, can I use your name, Joe Ping? And I'm also going to add the matriculation number. So matriculation number. And that is going to be not a string, but rather a number. And we're going to just make up a number there. That is not Zhou Ping's matriculation number, just something that I just made up. And then we're going to add also another item. Uh, we're going to call it date of birth, date of birth, D-O-B. And in the value of that, I'm going to choose, okay, let's create superhuman as a flag. And we're going to go to Boolean, choose a value of either true or false, and assign to true. So Joping is a superhuman. And now if I go to the Eta JSON tab, this text here corresponds to this kind of structure that I created in the visual editor. If I click done there, and I click done again, and I connect these two, and I deploy, and I'm going to clear this one, and I'm going to inject, then I see that I have injected an object that contains a name attribute, a matriculation attribute, and a superhuman attribute. I injected all of that into the message payload payload using the JSON. To make things a little bit more clear, I can also double click the inject node and say, inject, inject an object. I can give it a description, inject an object describing Zhoping. And you see now that the description has become a label for the node, and there's a blue circle that indicates that I haven't deployed this yet. And now the same uh, cannot, okay, so the Redis node is giving me those errors. Let me remove the Redis node. Now, let me inject this again. So now what I'm getting is the object. But what if I wanted to convert that to JSON, back to JSON, to the string? I can use a JSON conversion node and just drop it in between. And I really like the JSON conversion node because it's a very smart node. If you give it an object, it gives you a JSON text. If you give it a JSON text, it gives you an object. So it's you need, it's, but it works in both directions. So now in this case, we're giving it an object. And if I inject it, what you're getting out is the text that describes that object. So again, what does that mean? What is the, um, what is the outcome of that? Is that JSON corresponds to a structure, an object. So you could have a document, an HTML document, converted to JSON very, very easily. Like you have a web page. A web page has different fields, have divs, have spans, have headers. You can use an HTML to JSON converter and then store all your JSON documents in a JSON database. And that's like MongoDB um, and also Elasticsearch could also be used to searching uh, documents like that. So is that clear? So just kind of wrap up a little bit. 
In the beginning, the simplest kind of database is like Redis. It just stores a single value and a single key. Uh, something like uh, Cassandra it stores a number of values in a single key. Something like MongoDB can actually store full documents and allow you to search those documents. So you see, I want to look for any JSON document that has a title, title attribute of this and that. So that's a little bit more complicated. And it goes on and on. There's also like the classical, so let's continue. Scale. Luckily, we have this thing that's been around forever called the relational database. You're likely familiar with this type of database with flavors like MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, and Man. Anybody heard of MySQL or SQL? Anybody heard of SQL? It's something that you hear a lot. Anybody heard of Oracle? Oracle, SQL, it's all kind of the same. That's relational databases. So in the, in the very old school way of building computer software, we use relational databases a lot. So in my, my generation, we'll have like multiple courses on relational databases. So they are the oldest class of databases that exist. And it's definitely the most involved. So just for you to know is that with relational databases, you can do very, very powerful things, but you cannot just plug and play. You cannot just drag something and use it in a relational database. You have to design a schema, you have to enter the data manually, you have to create SQL statements that acquire the data. So it's a little bit more involved. If you join all this data together, we can run a query. And aside from that, there are more recent databases like graph databases and stuff like that. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all that because every project would likely require some sort of database. And depending on what your project is, you might need to install additional nodes to handle the kind of database that you want to use. So let me show you an example of how to install MySQL uh, nodes. So if you go to the, sand, uh, to the sandwich or to the hamburger icon in the corner over here, and you click it, then you go to the manage palette option, if you are following with me right now, you go to the install tab, and you'll be able to search all the nodes there are for a specific technology. So let me just give you some examples. You can install nodes in Node-RED to communicate with databases. You can install nodes in Node-RED to communicate with APIs. For example, uh, Google Documents, you can very easily connect to a Google Excel sheet using your, um, it's, it's very straightforward. You can also install, if you have a, uh, like a, a um, a paid WhatsApp account, you can also install a WhatsApp node and send automated messages, build a WhatsApp bot. You can also do that with Telegram. Telegram nodes are very easy to use. We use them a lot of in this course. A lot of people build uh, construction concepts in based on Telegram. So what does that mean? You can have a web interface for your application, but you also can have a Telegram interface. For example, an example of a Telegram bot that does something useful we could create a Telegram bot to track your attendance in this class. And all of you add the Telegram bot to your Telegram on your phone, and you just say hello. You just say hello in the bot when you enter the classroom, and the bot will see who sent that message and mark them as, their, as, atten as if attended. So that's also possible. You can always search uh, different nodes for example, if you run, uh, if you run Node-RED on a Raspberry Pi, you might be able to find nodes for specific sensors here. For example, if I write temperature sensor, and that might seem crazy, because like temperature sensor, what? On a Raspberry Pi, yeah, so on, on a Node-RED, yes, because Node-RED can also run on embedded computers, which allow you to access sensors. So there are nodes that also can uh, communicate with specific sensors. And, okay, one, one more thing before we end, just five minutes. So there is a very, very popular uh, addition to Node-RED, which will, I'm sure will blow your mind. It's called the dashboard, uh, the dashboard node. So I would like everybody to go to Manage Palette, to go to Install, and to type Dashboard. I assure you, this is worth your time. You will have to look for node minus red minus dashboard. It's currently at version 3.1.7 and the last update of this node is three weeks ago. You'll have to click on the install button here in the corner 
and if you install it, then it will appear in the left side. And we will I, I would like to wait until everybody have done that, so all of us have the dashboard nodes. So in the left side, you'll have a dashboard section, and it has a lot of nodes. And all of those nodes will be installed just by installing node minus red minus dashboard. The one updated three weeks ago, the one point, version 3.1.7. Can you raise your hand if you kindly, uh, kindly managed to do this so I know? Yeah? Okay, let's wait for the rest. So what this will allow you to do, this will allow you to create an actual user interface. So what you're looking at right now is the programming view of Node-RED. This is not the user view. This is not the view uh, anybody is supposed to see aside from you, the architect of the application. But what if you needed to create an interface where somebody could fire a plasma torch? Or create an interface where somebody could uh, input values or draw something or interact with your application? This is not the place to interact with your application. So the people who made Node-RED created another parallel concept called the concept of a dashboard. It's a different link than the link you use to open Node-RED itself. So what we're gonna do, we are going to drag and drop a button, a button node from the dashboard. And once we drag and drop a button, it will have a blue circle and a red triangle. And I would like you to tell me what each one of those means. The blue circle is that it's not deployed. The blue circle means it's not deployed. What does that mean that it's not deployed? Activate. Yeah, so you have, it, it's not working yet, it's not, yeah, it, it's like a refresh, but the red triangle, what is the red triangle? When I press the button, it's like the input, the input of the button. Uh, probably doesn't understand what, it needs to be defined. It needs configuration. There are some nodes that need configuration. It means that this one will not be deployed. It cannot be deployed because it's misconfigured. So. Any, any dashboard node, unlike any other node, it requires some supporting, supporting infrastructure. You don't yet have any user interfaces in which this button can fit. And the way user interfaces work in Node-RED um, is that, um, let's, so in, in a user, in a, the user interface in Node-RED is made up of two things. Let me just revise what those things are cool. Okay, so there is, there is the name of the interface, so you could have multiple interfaces. Those are called tabs. So there is inside of the interface. So this is the node red interface. Inside of the interface, you'll have a tab, and inside the tab, you'll have multiple groups. And your buttons and any other dashboard element will have to fit there. So if you have, for example, a checkbox, which is a very common UI element, this will have to fit inside of a group, which in turn fit inside of a tab, which in turn fits inside of the interface. So if you don't create the tab and the group, there's no place to fit buttons and there's no way to fit anything. So we need to create those supporting structures. Those supporting structures will be created from the right side. If you go to the right side and you choose the dashboard view, you'll have the ability to create a tab and inside of that tab create groups so that you will be able to assign your user interface element to the right place so you can have a user interface. So we're gonna first create a tab. We're gonna call that tab we're gonna edit that tab. Now this tab is interesting because it has a properties dialog similar to nodes. And that is no coincidence, my friends, because this is actually a node, but it's a different kind of node. It's a hidden node. It's also in Node-RED, the jargon is that it's called a configuration node. So if I go to the right side, to configuration nodes from the right side, then you will see that I will have that tab 
as one of the hidden configuration nodes. And if you double click that configuration node, you'll have the same thing. But most people wouldn't do that. Most people will just go to the dashboard and will double click that tab and you'll be able to change the title. So I'm gonna edit that tab. Now I have the properties of that hidden or configuration node. I'm gonna tab name it um, DDP class supplement. And I'm gonna update it. Now that I created the tab, what's the next step to do? Uh, you, your UI element will have to fit inside of a group inside of that tab. So we still need to control, control another structure. If you hover over the tab, what do you see here? You see an option to create a group inside of that. So I'm going to click the plus group. Beautiful. Ah, yeah. You're right. It's very smart. Okay, so you have, he's, uh, you're right, I had it to unfold it. So we're just gonna create a group under there and we're gonna change the name of the group. Sorry for this. Okay, now I'm gonna cl double click the group and again, oh sorry, I'm gonna click the edit on the group and again, I have properties of that group. And you guessed it, that's correct, that group is also a hidden configuration node. So if I go down, uh, you have a UI group and I have the class supplement as a configuration node. But again, most people will just go to the group and click edit. And um, I'm going to call that Hello World Dashboard. Because it's an equivalent of a Hello World program, but it's a user interface program, which is different from what we did before. So now I do have a tab and I do have a group under that tab. Now is the time to double click my button, which is an actual node, and assign it to the tab. So tabs are de denoted using the following notation. Opening square bracket, the name of the tab, closing square bracket, space, the name of the group. Why do we have this notation? Because you could have the same group or a group with the same name under different tabs. So by choosing this one, what I have done now, I have assigned this button to that tab, sorry, to that group under this tab. And do you see what happened when I did that? What happened? The red triangle is gone. So now it is properly configured, but it is still, still not deployed. So if I deploy it now, I, in theory, should have a user interface link that I can give my customers or my user. And that user interface will have the tab, the group, and inside the group will have the button. And when somebody clicks that button, I'll be able to interact and create a logic here. I create the logic of the application here. So how do I create open the uh, dashboard? This is one of the most obscure interface elements in Node-RED is this open thingy. It looks like, you know, that open in a new tab kind of icon, which is only visible from the dashboard uh, tab. If you click on that, then you'll have the interface. And there you have it. You have an interface that you actually created with Node-RED. And when you click that button, that node will act as an input node. And it can send MQTT messages, it can turn lights on, it can turn lights off, it can turn torch, torches on and off, we've done it. It's pretty cool, it's very empowering. So let's go back and try to do something with that. Uh, the most boring and the only thing I will have time to do right now is just to maybe send it to a debug, but no, come on, let's not do that. Uh, what we can do, maybe create a little bit of uh, more of an interactive... Sorry, one moment. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to spice it up a little bit 
maybe not 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 so much but i'm going to go to the dashboard i'm going to look for an output node in the dashboard so if you see here you have some nodes over here that are purely output nodes like this text for example this text only has a socket on the left side so it is a read only text that can be displayed in your dashboard and as you can see it has a red triangle so how do i cure the red triangle i double click it and i do what which group excellent once i do that then it becomes blue now let me deploy and go to the other tab and see what happened. I do have the, uh, the tab, I do have the group, I do have the button, but I have a ticks on top of the button. You might say, why is it on top? Why is it not at the bottom? And if there is a way to create the layout, to change the layout. If you go to your tab in the dashboard group and you click on layout, you'll be able to change the layout of the tab. Put things on top of the other, change the width, do this kind of stuff. So you, you're starting to get it, right? So why does it not need to be connected? It needs to be connected. Let's do it. That's very good. I'm going to connect it right now. And if I connect it, what's going to happen is that when I click this button, some information is going to flow from the button node. It's going to go to the text node and something will appear. And indeed, this did happen. However, unfortunately, because the button is not configured, what I'm seeing is just the message ID or the hidden attribute on the message object. If I want to do this properly, I should configure the button to inject something in specific. So the payload to be injected, and you guessed it, I'm going to specify hello world. And now I would have created my user interface dashboard equivalent of a hello world program where you click a button and you see something appearing again it's very dumb because data comes from the inside data is contained in the in the data you haven't really got information from robots or send information to robot but really it's really super easy just with mqtt node that the input mqtt node that the output you can do all that stuff so that that shouldn't be difficult at all Uh, from the options of the text node. In the text node, you could see here, you could uh, label, value, label, value, label, value, and you could change the label. So label, you could remove it. If I deploy now, then I go here and the label is not there anymore. Yeah? So did, anyway, uh, what did I want to say? Was this it? Yeah. So the thing is, just remember, that this link that gives this interface is completely separate from the link that gives you the Node-RED view where you do your programming. These are completely different. That link you give to your customers, that link you give to your users, and this link is the one that you use to do all of your logic. Any questions? Okay, so just, just, to, to, just to put things in perspective, that this is the tool that we're going to use. Node-RED is the tool we're going to use to architect our prototypes, to create user interfaces for our prototypes. Uh, Node-RED is going to connect to external things using uh, messaging protocols like MQTT, but it's also going to happen in a lot of time where you can run a Docker container on the same machine and you can connect with it using some of the uh, awesome nodes here. Uh, in order to connect with APIs, if you have a specific API like the Google API, you go look for Google API nodes using the managed palette. If you have a very, very simple API that just requires an HTTP call, like just opening something in the browser, you can use the HTTPN and the, no, not the HTTP and the HTTP out. So um, HTTP request, you can use HTTP request to make API calls, very simple API calls. You can use WebSocket out. So just I don't want to get deep into it, but from Node-RED you can connect to APIs, from Node-RED you can store files, from Node-RED you can send messages to Telegram, from Node-RED you can do a lot of things. You can also keep on opening certain websites every five minutes and check when a field in the website changes. And it might seem like super complicated, but it's super easy. 
Like and one of the projects that I used to give in previous terms was to go to the sports website of the university and create a selector for the part of the page that resonates whether it's slotted open or closed. And you can create a telegram, uh, sorry, a Node-RED bot that keeps on refreshing and tells you when certain slots open. Send you an email, send you a telegram message so you can go and register. And that stuff maybe takes 10 minutes to do. Yeah? Any questions? The only way to save so a project is to export it and every time you import it again? That's an excellent question. Well, the thing is, Node-RED is so amazing, it has a feature called projects. And I didn't teach you that because I really didn't have the time. You can pull visual Node-RED programs from repositories. You can push them, you can branch them. The same way you have Git integration in Visual Studio Code, you have Git integration in Node-RED. But that's the feature called the Projects feature, and it needs to be uh, 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 configured manually. And you'll have to uh, Google how to switch on projects in Node-RED to do that. But the good thing is that even you can resolve merge requests visually. So you'll have on the left side the flow before the merge request, the flow, and you choose the same way in text, you choose this, their change over your change, or your change over their change. You can do that uh, visually using Node-RED. So Node-RED is not only a visual programming tool, it's also have built-in version control Git support uh, and many other features as well. Hmm? Any questions? <laughs>